This Christmas time, we're going to take an imaginary journey to a small town, a town not unlike your town, a town like any town. It's a place that has good people and a few who are misguided. Now, in your imaginations, travel with me to Bedford Falls. It's Christmas time in Bedford Falls. The snow is lightly falling. The scene opens with pictures of different townspeople praying, and they're praying for one particular man named George Bailey. They're praying words like, Dear Father, I owe everything to George Bailey. Please help him. Dear Father, please help my friend George Bailey. George Bailey is a good guy. Help him, God. We learn early in this story the truth of God, that prayers are never wasted, that prayers are always heard and always answered. No prayer ever prayed falls on deaf ears. And this was the case that night as God's helpers, the angels, were discussing how and who to send with divine intervention to help George Bailey. They decide on one particular angel whose name is Clarence. There is a great disagreement among the angels on whether to send Clarence because he has botched things up in the past. But it is decided in this meeting of the angels to give him another chance because of his simple faith, like a child's faith. And so they give Clarence this second chance. The angels tell Clarence, there is a man who is needing help, and Clarence is delighted. He's filled with joy because he wants to give. Clarence asks, is he sick? And the angels say, no, he's not. It's worse. He is discouraged. They tell him that he will not win his wings this time if he doesn't get the job right. If he's able to help George Bailey realize his worth and his purpose, he will. The angels show Clarence a panorama of George Bailey's life. It begins one winter way back in 1919. All the kids are out playing, and George is 12 years old in this scene. The boys are sliding down the hill across an ice-covered lake. George's brother, Harry Bailey, slides down the hill, and as he slides down the hill, he slides into the ice. The ice breaks under him, and he falls into the pond. George saves his brother's life that day, but he caught a bad cold, and he lost his hearing in one ear. It was weeks before he was able to go back to his after-school job in Mr. Goward's drugstore. In this drugstore, we see George as he closes his eyes and he pushes on the cigar lighter on the counter, and every time he pushes on it, he says, I wish I had a million dollars. If it lights, supposedly, he gets his wish, and it does light, and he says, hot dog. Later we see George never goes after his wish to become rich. He chooses differently. He chooses not to go after material gains in his life. We also learn something that is very important to us as spiritual students, that a wish is just a passing fancy. Whoever prays must have the prayer's burning desire for the prayer to become manifest. Mr. Goward has been drinking heavily. He is quite drunk. He received a telegram that informed him that his son had died, and he calls George into the back room because 
He has a prescription for George to deliver to a home. But George, watching Mr. Goward in his drunkenness, notices that he puts poison into the bottle instead of the prescribed medication. George goes away not knowing what to do. He refuses to deliver the prescription. And when he comes back, Mr. Goward is very, very mad. Mr. Goward is then told the truth that he put poison by mistake in the prescription bottle. Mr. Goward hugs him and holds him for saving this woman's life and probably saving his. Now, Clarence, the angel, views George at 21 years of age. George is dreaming of seeing the world, going out into the world and experiencing all that there is to experience, make his mark. The angel sees, for the very first time, another character. Another character is a man by the name of Henry F. Potter the richest, meanest man in all the county. The angel sees how Mr. Potter, who owns the bank, belittles George's father, the president of the small Bailey building and loan. George's father holds his head and says, gee, I thought when we put Potter on the board of directors, well, he would ease up on us a bit. But of course, it hasn't happened. Anytime you promote negativity to a high place, to a point of power, it does not dissipate. The negative energy only builds. And George asks his father, what's wrong with Mr. Potter, Dad? And he says, oh, he's a sick man, sick in his mind, sick in his soul. He hates anyone that has anything he doesn't have. And he looks at his son and says, he lacks love, the most important thing of all. This is something George Bailey has. Potter has a million dollars, but it hasn't brought him happiness. He has nothing but emptiness because he lacks love. George wants to do something important with his life. He wants to do something big. He doesn't want to work with his father in the building and loan. At this point, another theme develops. Big things in your life, things that are often great, are done in little steps, sometimes invisible to our eyes, but not in the overall plan of greatness in God. We have to be patient and allow these to come to pass. Well, a sad time, George's father has a stroke and dies. George gives up his trip to Europe and for three months helps keep the building and loan business going. Mr. Potter, now on the board, presents a motion to close the building and loan, and the money and the debts be taken over by the bank which he owns. Potter wants to foreclose on the special accounts in the building and loan, the ones that have been given to people and the ones that have given them a chance in life, a chance to move out of Potter's run-down rentals and build themselves nice homes. It is also employment for Uncle Billy, who is probably incapable of being employed anywhere else. The board makes a decision. They insist George stays on to keep his friends out of Potter's hands. He agrees, of course. He gives his college money away to his brother Harry, giving him a chance at an education. He gives and he gives the most important gift of all, a piece of himself. He begins to get depressed because he doesn't notice how much love is surrounding him. He doesn't realize that he, 
has found it all. Everything a person could possibly seek in life right where he is in Bedford Falls. He doesn't have to go anywhere else to find his good. He has found it all. In fact, he is the richest man in town. He falls in love with a wonderful local girl named Mary. They're wed. His friend, Sam Wainwright, gives him a ground for opportunity to get in on. And he, instead of accepting good for himself, persuades Sam to move his new plant to Bedford Falls to give hundreds of people a chance for employment again. Again, he turns down some worldly good for his own life, and in so doing keeps people away from the poverty of Potter. He's leaving on his honeymoon now, and he notices a run on the bank. Mary tries to keep him from looking back. She wants him to go with her into the world, but he can't. He stops to save the building and loan. It is seen that Potter uses people's despair and their fear. Potter uses the power of appearances. He tries to buy all the shares for pennies on the dollar. My friends, when you look only to appearances, you sell out easily and you lose everything. Nothing is ever as bleak as it appears to the eye and to the fear. People want to see with their eyes. They want to see their money in the building and loan. And George says to them, the money isn't here. Why, it's in Bert home and in Joe's home and in Ernie's home. Many people also want to see God with their physical eyes, but you can't. God is in Bert and Joe and Ernie. God invests in you in the same way that the building and loan invested in people. He uses his honeymoon money to still the artificial panic created by Potter. People that look to panic only, they find panic. People who look to God only always find God. They find faith. They find help. The building and loan stays open and the panic is dissolved. George is again moneyless, but he's surrounded by even more love, which is priceless. The years follow. More and more people realize their dreams of a new home, and they move away from Potter's control. Potter calls George to his office one day. He offers him the world. He thinks, if I can't work against him, I'll work for him and he offers George a high salary and travel. It is George's moment of temptation in the wilderness. We all have several of these in a lifetime. He's offered $20,000 a year to work with Potter, a great deal of money in those days, versus the $45 a week that he gets at the building and loan. He hesitates, but he chooses his values, as we must choose ours. He chooses to be his own person, but he leaves depressed because he knows what he has turned down. George and Mary continue their happy life. They have a boy and a girl and later on two more children. George never leaves Bedford Falls. The war breaks out and Harry, George's brother, is a war hero. He, single-handedly, saves hundreds of men's lives. George stays home, classified 4F because of his ear. Now Clarence, the angel, views Christmas time. This particular Christmas, George is out on the sidewalk proudly handing out newspapers to all of his friends that tells about Harry being decorated by the President of the United States. And he walks back slowly to the building and loan on December 24th. And he finds in the building and loan the bank examiner sitting there waiting for him. A forgetful Uncle Billy is at Potter's Bank 
making the required $8,000 building and loan deposit. When handing Potter the newspaper and bragging about Harry's war medal, he accidentally hands Potter the bank deposit, which is wrapped inside the newspaper. Potter notices this, and the 8000 is lost, and Potter steals the good and waits for the panic to set in. Uncle Billy practically loses his mind. George never publicly blames Uncle Billy. To save Uncle Billy, George accepts responsibility for the scandal. In desperation, George goes to Potter. Potter, though, instead of helping him, calls the police to arrest George. He tells George that with his insurance, he's worth more dead than alive. George, a non-drinking man, goes to a bar on Christmas Eve night, and he drinks, and he prays to God, and he says, God, if you're there, I'm not a praying man, but I need you to show me the way. George is in a daze, and he plans to end his life. He walks slowly in that daze to a snow-covered bridge. The snow is coming down, blowing in his face, and he plans to jump in the icy water of the river. This is where Clarence the Angel comes in. He knows George intimately, so he jumps in the water first. He knows that George will jump in to save him. He knows that in that moment, George will put aside again himself and will think about others in saving the angel. That's exactly what happens. George and the angel go to a nearby house to dry off. The angel tells George that his prayer was answered, that all prayers are always answered, and that he, the angel, is the answer to George's prayer. We hardly ever recognize when our prayers are answered or the form that they're answered in. And George doesn't recognize the answer to his prayer. He just doesn't believe. George tells the angel why, if I hadn't been born, a whole lot of people in this world would have been a lot better off. I wish that I had never been born. The angel says, yes, that's it. That's it. I'll do it. Okay. You've never been born. You've got your wish. And a heavenly breeze blows in, and immediately George sees that everything is different. We begin to see what a tremendous difference one life makes in this world, in the total tapestry of God's plan. We see immediately that the whole town is changed. The flavor of the town is changed. The people now are discouraged and mean. They're frustrated. They are beaten down. Clarence and George go into a local bar and they see the local people all changed. Mean, hateful attitudes. Mr. Goward, the pharmacist, is now the town trunk. He has been in jail for a total of 20 years for poisoning that woman way back when. The angel tells the shocked George, You haven't been born. You've been given a great gift, George, a chance to see what the world would be like without you. The town sign at the city limit now says Pottersville. And how different that town is. It's filled with pawnbrokers, slums, bars, crime. There is no building and loan. All the people are so depressed. Previously happy married couples are now divorced. The town is in ruins and so are the people within. George searches in desperation for his wife and he finds his mother who looks old and wrinkled beyond her years. She now runs a boarding house. 
He mentions Harry, and she looks shocked as she said why he died in 1919. He mentions Uncle Billy, and again, she looks shocked and says, Who are you? Uncle Billy is in the insane asylum. And then the angel says to George, The true words that I say to you right now, it's strange how much one person's life affects the lives of others. One life lost leaves a terrible hole. The angel said that because Harry wasn't in World War II, hundreds of men's lives were lost because George wasn't there to save Harry. Mary, his wife, is an old maid. George runs back to the bridge and prays, God, I want to live again. Send me back. Send me back. I want to live again. And a breeze blows, and he re-enters life. The Holy Spirit moves the activity of God within him. His problems are the same, but George is different. When God enters your life, you can face the problems in your life, those same problems that a minute ago seemed unbearable. But the difference is, you are changed. And this is the way it is with George. He runs through the town with a smile on his face. He shouts at everyone, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. He runs back home. And the bank examiner is there with the police. George greets them with joy. He runs to his wife and his children, and joy fills his heart. He now sees for the first time what is real value in life. The real value, the rich life, is a life of love. He laughs at trouble. And the whole town comes to his side with love and an outpouring of money. God works through humans, giving them the idea to help George, and will work through them to help you. The outpouring of love continues all night long. Ernie brings a telegram from Sam Wainwright that says that he will advance up to $25,000. The bank examiner smiles, the police tear up the warrant for George's arrest. Harry comes in from Washington and proposes a toast to George, the richest man in town. And in the pile of gifts, George finds a note from Clarence. It says, No man is a failure who has friends. In this story, Potter is worldly error thought. Many times we're surrounded with this in our life. George Bailey is Christ love manifesting. And Bedford Falls is the love manifested idea. Clarence the angel is the divine idea of love coming to you. When you're surrounded with bitterness, when you're surrounded with hate, when you're surrounded with quarreling, allow the divine angel of love to come to you. Things might remain unchanged for a while, at least to your eyes. But as you do this, you will be changed as the spirit of Christmas comes alive inside of you. And then over time, your entire world will change, not just the town you live in. When love isn't born, only worldly error manifests. The name of this, in this particular story, is Pottersville. Pottersville is filled with error worldly thought. But remember what our Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. This Christmas, 
begin to build your own Bedford Falls in the world around you. You are George Bailey in your world. You can spend a lot of money on a whole lot of gifts this Christmas season, but the best gift that you can ever give is a gift of yourself. In every situation, giving of yourself is the one thing people will value more than anything else because it's the one thing they can't receive from anyone else, your own individual love. You have decided to do this because you are following Jesus Christ this Christmas. And this is the message of Jesus Christ, to become love in our world. You do make a difference. One person can make a incredible difference in the world. You make a positive difference in your world. You're God's gift to your individual world. You have a purpose and you are very needed by the world and by God. Please understand our true thoughts are angels. They always minister to us in days of despondency, in days of discouragement, we rest in the thought that we have done a good deed in a particular instance or that we have been good at a particular time. Every thought of goodness makes a place, a form, and sets up a friendly habit of mind that is permanent inside of you and that in your time of need it will minister to you. You are glad to accept this calling, for you have done good because the Spirit of God is working through you, and it is continuous. Thus, you reap the benefit of all the good that you have ever done or thought. Your thoughts give back results of the same nature as themselves, and in the silence of prayer, you have earnestly held to the pure and the good, and you have built a place within you for the pure and the good. You are building yourself this Christmas. You're building your environment, your town, and your world. My good friend, I wish you from my family to your family the very merriest of Christmases. May God bless you.